Welcome. All right, so I am Teresa Garcia, and I'm your moderator for this roundtable on gender and sexuality in LARC. And I'm going to go this way. And if you could just introduce yourself with a few sentences about what you do, that'd be great. Great. Um, my name is Haley Steele. I uh, uh, am a I, I'm a theorist, and, and I'm a certified artist. I have an MFA, um, but I have been writing about uh, gender in LARP uh, since 2006, um, where I, I wrote an article series for Surreal's Magazine, a, uh, a now defunct online magazine for women, women's gamers. And that was when I, I first started thinking about gender in LARP. Um, and I'm currently working on a, a piece called the Gender Playability Handbook. Yes. With the goal of seeing how can we better render gender playable mm -hmm. in LARP contexts. Awesome. Thank you. Um, I am Danielle Harper. I am a writer, a game designer, developer, um, LARPer. I've been doing games and LARPs for oh, an embarrassment amount of years. Um, and I'm not, uh, I'm not a theorist. I don't, uh, I'm not an academic, at least i not in the LARP space, uh, but I am a feminist and I am also hyper aware of the thing like gender in our game space and how we treat it and what we what we view and uh, kind of when I when I first talked to Sarah about doing a panel like this I mentioned uh, specifically roles that genders have not just women but gender gender roles that people subconsciously take up or societally feel are normal in, in, in how we translate those into LARP and, and how we can explore differences in LARP and whether or not we should or whatever. So I kind of am on this panel, but I'm not nearly as qualified as these other ladies. <laughs> okay, we all bring something to the panel, including all the people all the way around the circle. Yeah. So we go through. Um, my name is Mari Brown, and I am uh, one of the co-organizers for New World Magiscola. And <laughs> we are doing uh, something that um, is maybe a little different um, in that all of the um, characters in the game are written in the second person with uh, no gender markers and then the gender and the sexuality is decided by the player and um, we are looking also with trying to define the magical universe with things like the default pronoun in the magical universe is they and um, I am a college professor and I um, study um, cultural studies. I teach cultural studies and I study specifically gender in LARP right now, um, particularly looking at the difference between how gender is performed versus how gender is represented. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm, I'm Liz Grinsky. I was a relatively late add to this panel, so sorry if I was, you were not warned that I would be here. Um, I think that um, Lizzie asked me to, to step in, I think in part because um, I just brought a uh, I, I, I'm a baby in this space, but I've done a little bit of game design. Uh, most recently, uh, with uh, co-author Sarah Williamson, I brought a game to Festival called See Me Now, uh, which is a freeform style game about um, development of uh, gender and sexuality in a group of friends over life. Um, I do some work organizing in New York City, in which um, I think similarly, kind of attempting to, we play primarily Nordic style games, but effectively attempting to kind of um, at hack those to, to a little bit so that they fit our very queer, um, you know, very feminist um, and not always a gender binary uh, playing population. Excellent. So to give you guys an idea, this um, panel runs from uh, 3.15 to 4.30. That's, I've got a, a bunch of questions, but we can veer off topic as needed. Um, but ideally, I'd like to stick to about five minutes per question, just so that we can move through a variety of things. Um, uh, any of our panelists, I, I kind of like put it so these, some of these questions are directed at particular ones of you, but uh, certainly feel free to jump in on someone else's question. Uh, same goes for the audience. If you've got questions, um, I would just ask, like, indicate with your hand so that we can note that you have something you'd like to add. Um, but it is a roundtable discussion, so it'd be great if you uh, ask questions as we go along. Okay? Um, all right, so uh, this first question kind of goes to Danielle, but this can go to anyone, really. Uh, just that in inclusivity often starts before a player ever sets foot on a game site. Uh, can you talk a bit about how LARP has included women in the past and present and how that's changed over time since you've kind of seen yeah. this transition, especially here? Um, so, yeah, like, you know, we talk about game space and um, 
you know, game space is where we play games. It's it's also the community that games get played in, and uh, game space starts with the community and then goes into the game. And you know, a lot of a lot of women, I, I feel like, uh, in a lot of different LARP spaces, feel way more included in LARP spaces than they do in uh, other styles of mm -hmm. game spaces. So, like tabletop game space is, you know traditionally kind of a male dominated space there are women in tabletop game spaces but they are uh, underrepresented and um, as evidenced by even very current uh, conversations in some places woefully unwelcome um, and in LARP uh, certain LARPs may have male dominated spaces but um, just you know ever since I was you know 16 years old most LARPs I have gone to have a decent uh, representation of women um, at the very least like 30 percent and in some cases up to half of the game players and even more than half of the game players are women um, and it's not necessarily uh, and, and I, I hate to say this but it's not necessarily because the community was like women come join us but it was because you know, women who are interested in those kinds of things saw an outlet for uh, an activity and they all got together and were like, let's try this thing out together. And so they just kind of brought themselves. Um, and then they were the community and so they were more welcoming to more women showing up. Mm -hmm. um, and I feel like a lot of LARP space is uh, hands and feet above a lot of other spaces as far as being inclusive to women in, and other like and just non-binary genders and just m way more accepting of those things than than some other spaces of many different types. All right. I don't know if there's anything you want to add. On that. I think that's really interesting um, because I think there's a difference between including women into the community and what women are allowed to do mm -hmm. in the community. Yeah, mm -hmm. absolutely. Um, and so the fact that they are there. Um, is not the same as whether or not they um, have as much choice mm -hmm. or as much power, either in game or out of game. So that's a different question. That is a different <laughs> question. Um, yeah. But um, well, we but, can talk about that one too. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that's why we're here. So yeah, if you want to elaborate on that, we can continue on with it. Well, I just it, I, I've been larping for a long time, and I started with um, SCA style activities, and I got very um, frustrated very quickly because I was relegated to very specific. Um, mm -hmm. role types and costuming standards um, and um, as a smaller body woman um, combat was um, something I, I'm, I'm very athletic and I actually can participate in but um, also was at an inherent disadvantage for for in some cases and in some cases not allowed mm -hmm. to play because it was not immersive mm -hmm. um, and so I've seen that beginning to change but it's still very um, troublesome in that you have um, people who are uh, considered conventionally pretty cast in romance plots despite their um, preferences and people who um, don't want to play um, specific roles being given those roles based on how they look mm -hmm. or uh, people who are either uh, cross-playing or are trans players who are told they can't portray a particular gender um, because um, they are not believable. I mean there's a lot of toxicity that comes out um, around gender despite being part of of the community and being there, um, I think that's beginning to change in some communities. But uh, gender policing is is a, a huge problem, I think, still in the in the gaming community, and and, and it's it's huge in LARP because of bodies um, versus um, being able to choose an avatar. Right, or a and, and I'm going to get to that in a yeah. So you mentioned gender playability, and I think that ties very directly into that mm -hmm. sort of thing. Um, can you talk a little bit about what that is for people who don't know what gender playability is and how that ties into what roles you're kind of told you can do? For sure, for sure. It, but you know, um, uh, just kind of piggybacking on on some of the stuff that that Mara was just talking about. And, um, you know, uh, last night um, uh, at, at dinner, a, a group of us were having a conversation about different stuff we've encountered in games, and someone was talking about a secrets and powers game in which the folks who uh, wrote the characters, there was a trans man um, playing the game, and he was given the role of a woman disguised as a man who is secretly in love with one of the, the male characters. And clearly, you can, you can see how, 
how problematic horrible. <laughs> how horrible it is to you know but problematic yes you know and it, it, it it's interesting being in in a, a progressive space and realizing all right there's some stuff that many of us take for granted which is that a trans man is a man and some folks don't take that for granted mm -hmm. and in the way they write their game uh, there's that danger of uh, of having someone misgendered, and in the uh, workshop we were in last night, there, there was a situation we had to talk about, like, what do you do when the game staff doesn't understand their own biases? Mm -hmm. um, but mm -hmm. taking that a step further into gender playability, which would be looking like outside of character creation and going down into the subset of the rules, um, you're, you're looking more at, um, like, what features of the, the, the characters are part of the, the social code of the game and, and what features of, of the characters are part of the, the actual, the, the rules of the game. Um, you know, and, and, and uh, the concept of gender playability is, is still very much a, a work in process. Um, and like right now, the easier thing to focus on is, is racial playability because you already have races in many of these games. Uh, you uh, pick up a, an alliance rule book and it actually says races, which is really problematic. And there's this funny thing <laughs> that happens with races and alliance in which you have racial abilities that are biologically essentialized. And, uh, and it, 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 it does this funny thing of projecting uh, the game designer's concept of what races into the game by by promoting this idea that, that race, the cultural things of race are actually inherent mm -hmm. in the character's bodies. And I, I see this as something that mm -hmm. has to change in all LARPs. Mm -hmm. um, but gender, on the other hand, isn't written into the mechanics of the rules. Rather, and um, Mari mentioned this in her talk last night, but rather is uh, something that you find emerging, where out of game gender mechanics um, emerge within the game context. Uh, I, I worked with um, another person, an anthropology person, uh, about 10 years ago to write a, a species of elves for Nero, our alliance, um, uh, that our, our chapter accepted that had five genders. And we were so excited, we were like, we have five gendered elves, this is gonna be great, we're gonna transform the game, you know. And, uh, the plot accepted it, so we were able to go out as our elves, and we got some other folks to like join. So we had a whole house of these uh, five gendered elves, and we based it on like time of day that you're awake as our our gender qualifier there. Um, and each time of day person had a like different interaction uh, with with other folks from from the tribe. Um, but th this funny thing happened in terms of uh, uh, the ability to be recognized for our gender signifiers by other players, in which the other players didn't know how to recognize our elf tribe's very specific um, signifiers and things just broke down really quickly where other players didn't know what to do with us and just kind of stopped interacting. Mm -hmm. um, and so building gender playability into the game does mean putting the onus on the, the whole community. If there's a new gender implemented, it can't just be within that group, but you have to have the whole community understanding what these signifiers are, how to interact with them to acknowledge the existence of that, that gender. Yes, Liz. The one thing I'd just like to add is that it, I, I've been atypically lucky, I think, in that I, I started with indie tabletop and, like, you know, a sort of Nordic style LARP, and so I've never done the, the, the traditional side of things very much. And it seems that the big distinction is actually continuity of the structures of power. Mm -hmm. That we, in some sense, don't have these problems because our community is created often by the, the women that are within it, and they'll run individual one shot games. So it's not like you have people that are in charge because they've always been in charge, mm -hmm. it's the people that decide to do the work of organizing that get to decide a lot of these factors and that, that can, I think, unseat um, some of the, uh, unseat something from just being the assumed default. Sometimes the power of the archetypes, mm -hmm. um, which if you came from Dungeons and Dragons, Dungeons and Dragons is based entirely on archetypes. A lot of things like Jungian philosophy and the other things are based on the existence of these archetypes and this notion that they are universal, mm -hmm. right? Which is a problematic notion. Um, but the idea is that we have to use these archetypes as shortcuts to play or else people aren't able to engage. Mm -hmm. And if they don't have the shortcut, they don't know what to do. And so some of what I think Haley was saying was 
um, this is a, a different gender, but I, and I don't have this other knowledge for me to draw on, and I don't have a proper signifier for me to know what to do, and so I just then begin to ignore it or not believe it. And that's um, a huge problem as you try to break down the archetypes. If you don't replace them with something, mm -hmm. that is, then you've created a vacuum, and the archetypes just continue to get um, mm -hmm. repeated and replicated. And the notion, even, that archetypes are necessary for play should be interrogated. Interesting. Mm -hmm. um, so this question was originally going to go to Liz, but we've already kind of like touched on it a bit. Uh, that if we want to portray a character that's a different gender from our own, either because we ourselves are trans or gender fluid, or just because we want to explore and game what it's like to be a different gender, how do we go about portraying that in a way that people can understand? And this is really interesting because you also bring in the idea of five genders, which is much more than in real life we, we normally ever seem to experience. Yeah. Um, yeah, I guess I'd start with that. Is that I, mean, like, I think it, a lot of this depends on kind of the, the, the larger structure of the game. But um, so uh, in, in the traditions that I play, and we often have a lot of workshopping, and you can do specific workshopping around this. Um, and just assuming that either anything that is, I guess, differential from either say, n normal accepted everyday life, sometimes like giving people a skill to help with that can be really useful. Um, uh, so in the game that I brought to the festival, we had um, basically characters might be transitioning um, uh, genders during the course of the game. And so we had a two-tiered name tag badge and um, blank sli or like slips of paper so that people could switch their pronouns easily during the course of the game, switch their names easily during the course of the game. We also had a specific pronoun call-out mechanism that it's, um, we trained players in if somebody, it, like in this game, we recognize that it's going to be difficult that, you know, that somebody might be modeling different genders over the course of the game. Mm -hmm. So um, if somebody, screw, you know, sorry, if somebody um, does not, like, you know, represents a gender or a name of somebody incorrectly, you could do like a, a pronoun call out during the course of the game or just say pronoun. And just accepting that this is a thing that we all want to work together mm -hmm. to get correct um, makes makes it, I think, a lot easier for everybody in that game to have the tools to deal with that. And that's just one example. I think that we can like um, that. Um, I, and I've heard in um, some of the um, sort of, um, I guess, uh, in the Nordic LARPs, for example, where they do, um, uh, it, they'd uh, uh, give uh, say a. a um, uh, uh, I'm forgetting the name of the one in which basically like it, it's a. Um, a matriarchy and like women have all the power within the game, but they would do specific, I think, workshopping around um, the physicality of, I guess, say like the servitude of the masculine members of the society, and just sort of like, well, you, you know, like even just things that like you are assumed body language that you bring to this from the real world is not going to be, is gonna be out of place in this game. Huh. So that's super uh, interesting. Um, I just wanted to add really quickly. Um, actually had an experience, I played a, like I wanted to experience playing a male character, and so I played a male character for about five years in a vampire lark. And in that kind of situation, like people are not used to, they're not even used to, it, and at the time, like trans was a word, like I knew that there were trans people, but it wasn't one that was a buzzword, it wasn't being talked about. And you know, I only knew like I think two trans people I had ever met in my life at that point, and so I tried to be very respectful of the idea that you know I'm not trying to imitate trans. I am just trying to portray a male character in a in a game space, right? Mm -hmm. um, and so you know I dressed masculine, um, and I tried to you know present myself as masculine, but it it was a struggle to get people to recognize that the character was masculine, and so I spent a lot of time correcting gender pronouns and correcting, you know, gender assumptions and stuff like that. And then, you know, when when people like who are trans are in game spaces, like it's super sympathetic to them constantly having to correct gender pronouns because I only had to do it for five years for a game. Well, these people have to do it their entire lives. And mm -hmm. like LARP spaces are supposed to be safe spaces where you actually get to be yourself and for for someone to you know, spend their entire time going like, please, I am a man, please, mm -hmm. like, please, or just use they, like, I, I don't like that gender pronoun. It, it's, you know, it's distressing, and so, like, having that kind of, like, how do you represent that, I think, you know, doing workshopping and getting people, the community themselves, used to, like, trying to follow cues properly, it puts the onus off of the person who is being misgendered or trying to represent a different gender and puts the onus on the community itself. I think that's, it's fabulous. <laughs> yeah. Um, 
So this question's kind of for, for Maury, but in LARP we often focus on the concept of what you see is what you get. I feel like sometimes we're, we're moving away from that a little bit in that even in, in mainstream culture we're trying to change, like I'm not going to assume uh, what I see is what I get. But um, can you talk a bit about gender how can be effectively represented in game systems where you're expected to physically look like what you're playing? Uh, what are the unique issues presented by what you see is what you get system where it intersects with their own expectations for immersion? Yeah, absolutely. Well, that's a simple question. So thank you. <laughs> thank you for making such a softball and giving it, <laughs> and giving it to me. Um, that is the crux of role play there is believability. And if you are presenting as, as what you wish to be seen as, and others do not see you as that, you effectively don't exist. Mm -hmm. And it is um, excruciating. And it can be, it, uh, to have it happen to anyone mm -hmm. in a role playing game, I'm trying to be a warrior, I'm trying to be an elf, I'm trying to be um, a princess, I am trying to be a king. I am trying to be none of these, mm -hmm. right? And to have people continually not accept that means that you cannot interact. Your interactions only then become trying to defend mm -hmm. <laughs> what it is. So, so to have that happen to anyone in a game is troublesome. It becomes doubly troublesome when that's something that you deal with outside mm -hmm. of the game. Um, and so it's... Um, it's insidious and it's incredibly difficult to do because of um, costuming and because of the limitations of physical bodies and of um, people's preconceived ideas. And so there are certain markers that people use. Um, a lot of times uh, people use a corset mm -hmm. as a way to either indicate I'm portraying female or sometimes it's now being used more as um, warrior. It's mm -hmm. kind of fascinating that corsets mm -hmm. are becoming a thing of armor. Mm -hmm. um, and I know that well, that's partially the armor most of us ever. <laughs> yes, 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 yes. And the corsets have a, fan, um, a fantastic history. You know, they were they were they were completely patriarchal objects, right? Mm -hmm. To be done to change. Yeah. The there could be an entire too. panel on corsets. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> absolutely. But but women have, to, uh, have and people in general have taken them back as 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 and wearing them on the outside and, mm -hmm. and wearing and. and and they, um, but and I, I use them this way uh, as as uh, you, I, you can't actually touch me because <laughs> you know right. there's this course. But so there's the markers like that that can be sometimes done. There's also um, the sense one of the things we're trying with New World Magiscola is um, everyone wears a name tag. The name tag has your character name on it and your character's pronoun. The reverse of the name tag is your player's name and your player pronoun. Mm -hmm. um, if you do not fill out what your pronoun is, it will say they. And um, until you, yeah. until you change it, and so we have the luxury of being able to say we're creating a society from to start, and we're thinking about these things before it gets normalized mm -hmm. differently. Yes. Um, and so we are hopeful. It's also um, everyone. It's not put this on in addition mm -hmm. to your name tag if you wish to be, um, mm -hmm. mark, you know, yeah. called out mm -hmm. um, for it. So that's that's a it's a it's a it's a thought. Um, and so we'll see how it goes. Um, I feel like it goes well. This I think it's a great idea. Yeah. Yes. As someone who's going to be playing your game, um, mm -hmm. I see that it's the you're actually putting clear intentions of what you want for your game itself, mm -hmm. instead of leaving that up to interpretation. Which, mm -hmm. with interpretation, it can go a million directions, and some of those directions are not in a great space. So thank you for that for having the the, the intention clear and precise that needs being had, especially in a feminist game like New World Magic School. So yeah. I, mean, I think it's really interesting because there are some games that have been long running games that now are becoming aware of these mm -hmm. issues, but then almost like reverse engineering the game design to make it a common tool is very so difficult. difficult. Yeah, that's very what difficult. I meant by saying we have the, mm -hmm. the luxury yeah. of yeah. being able to say we're Before starting something. from yeah. from this. I think it is much harder to try to go back in mm -hmm. um, and do it's not impossible. Oh yeah. Um, but but much harder. Um, can I say one more thing? Sure, and then please, go ahead. <laughs> um, I think the other, the other part for, for what you, the question you've asked there is alignment, is are there examples in, in the lore of the game of um, the variety? That is, um, in fact, my next question. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like I'm just like, 
like one step behind all of you guys because you bring up what I wanted to talk about next. Um, this is organic, but yeah, it's fantastic. Uh, so I think I think maybe Liz wrote this question. Um, as with roles for women, sometimes writers are swayed by stereotype when it comes to crafting gay or queer characters or their issues or backstory. The gay man or woman whose first love died tragically and will never love again, or the slutty bisexual. How can we get beyond these tropes, especially if the creator does not have the QILTVAG mm -hmm. uh, yeah. community to seek real stories from or players to portray characters sensitively? Um, how do you strike the right balance between using GLBT characters as oversimplified vehicles for embodying queer issues and giving them space to play out the parts of these identities that are actually important to them? <laughs> Thank you, Liz. That's a softball. That's a softball question. It's so easy. You should answer your own question. Oh, good. Oh, yeah. 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 Can I answer the your own question? <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, so some of this is, uh, it, it, like, is actually, it's it's very tricky because I think it, like that that a lot of different players will have different um, you know notions of some people want it to be kind of like a forwarded like they want to really actively ask they want to be able to make these choices for themselves um, and um, and some people kind of want to um, you know want the alibi of like of something being chosen for them um, I think some people feel uh, you know that they can ask for um, not to be given a hetero relationship or to be explicitly like have their romances be clear. Um, uh, and I think a lot of that probably is, is pinned to um, do you feel that uh, your, uh, your, your game community is, is open to asking if you're a player um, and are you signaling as an organizer that um, this is something that is open for discussion? Um, and like, you know, is it, do you see in the game text that there's, uh, there are any characters or like long running characters that, uh, that have, uh, you know, non-hetero parents? Um, do you do you see the option of um, you know often uh, you'll, you'll kind of see you'll see a sign up for like a bigger game and it, it, if it comes down to there's there's always the cop out of like uh, you know that it, it, people will say yes we recognize that and sometimes they'll say here's a box with a fill in for the player pronoun but we need to excuse me for the character yeah for the player pronoun but we need to sort the characters into one or the other so just choose which one you'd like mm -hmm. and I'm like no like you, you can't actually stop there you like if you're going to do this you have to you have to do it right and but th at the same time also doing it 100% right for everyone is, is very tricky it's a moving target um, and in some in some cases i think it it requires a sort of familiarity with uh, I guess current uh, uh, gender theory and thinking that not everybody is prepared to do. So, uh, yeah. anecdotally, I had an interesting experience where a game really wanted to have those stories, those inclusive, like, there's an example of various different, like, gender types in this history mm -hmm. of the lore. Uh, but then there was a little bit of, like, a kickback in terms of, like, are we, are we forced forcing this into a, a path that it doesn't feel natural or, or it feels like we're just trying too hard to, to be inclusive in some way, um, where like the authenticity of the characters seemed like, well, maybe they were just the token gay character versus, you know. My flippant response to that is, in which world society is it ever True. natural to True. only have two genders? Like, yeah. <laughs> I, I actually have a, a comment about, like, especially sexuality and gender and, you know, portrayal by content developers because um, you know I, I, I write content not for LARP all the time like I make my own LARPs but I have tons of published tabletop content and you know I am a cis white female uh, who is also hetero and married to a man and you know these are my experiences but that does not make me unsympathetic or unempathetic to other people's experiences I understand love and love is the same no matter who you love right just because I have never loved a woman doesn't mean that I can't understand how women love each other, right? Because I understand how love works. And so when I write, you know, I try to include, uh, be as inclusive as it makes sense to be. You know, this, you know, I'm writing an example and I'm this, you know, this character I really feel needs to be queer because you know, I, he needs to be gay because it just makes sense, and not because I'm just trying to throw inclusivity in there. And then, after I've written it, I'm going to send it to one of my gay friends and be like, hey, does this sound okay? <laughs> because I'm, I'm well, not. It's super interesting because I, I feel like I, I've had those moments where I go, I can't tell if, how biased I am on whether this story seems authentic or not because it's not my experience. Um, and I look at it and I go, oh, it feels like they're just trying too hard to, like, to have one of everything. Um, but then... 
you know, from someone else's experience, is that it might be the exact opposite. Why am I not represented? Why am I not right. included? Um, and and finding like uh, it's I guess it's a good idea to like pull different different people and see uh, does that feel natural to you? Does that seem natural? Does that seem realistic? And yeah, we could never possibly clear all of the right. possible but realistic interpretations. Yeah. But I and I mean, if you only so they say you know write about what you know. But if I only wrote about what I knew there'd be a bunch of white women running around the world of darkness, <laughs> and that's all it would be, right, is straight white women running around, you know, the world of darkness. But I, I can't just write what I know. I have to learn about other things so I can know more and, and write about that as well. And so, um, you know, and, and by taking, making an effort as a content developer and as a content writer to push your own boundaries and to write things that you are unfamiliar with and then get, you know, it, and yes, it's, oh, it's forced inclusivity, but it's not actually. Those people are already playing those games. Those people are already included in that community. It's actually representation is what it is. It's not forced inclusivity. It's not that, oh, we needed a token thing so that we could be you know politically correct. No, we, we, we really need to represent the people who are enjoying the content. It's representation. It is, it's, it's, so people use that term, inclus oh, it's just forced inclusi in inclusivity, it's just, it's forced, it's there because, because they felt like they needed to include it, and it's, the answer is actually it's not, it's there because they needed to represent people who are already part, part of that community. Those people deserve representation so as well. Wanted relationships as agender as possible. Mm -hmm. Just don't write it in and let the like the players sort of choose that for themselves. Sure. Um, the downside of that is that I know that if I do this in my community, it'll be a bunch of queers and a bunch of trans people so that they will be represented. And uh -huh. that, um, it might just mean mm -hmm. that in some other player communities, the same game would look very different. Yeah. Um, but you don't necessarily want to force that on communities that are not ready to play it out. Um, mm -hmm. So it might be the lesser of two evils to yeah. say, Let's put it. Let's put the possibility space in yeah. there and see who it bodies. Well, it's really interesting because it does bring to mind the idea of like, well, what if you're playing a very specific setting, a very specific time? But you did mention kind of that. Well, in what community or culture did you not have these people? They were just, you know, they're beneath the surface, and a lot of things were just not recorded by history they're because it was different things are to do so. uh, Did you have a question over here? Oh yeah. So I'm sorry, I mean, that's uh, um, uh, uh, so it brings up yeah. So is there what what is a good way to to handle like really sexist societies, se societies that are sexist, that do not recognize these uh, these things, is that, I mean, you know, it's great to have to, to create a new society which is like that, but um, ca uh, how can or can, uh, you know, LARPs have societies that, that, are, um, that are sexist without the game being sexist? Mm, good question. Um, I will not a softball. That, I will <laughs> That, that the magic that. community is not as progressive as it thinks it is, because okay. that would be, again, sort of a, a, a washing or an erasing, right? It's like, yeah, we just solved all these problems, mm -hmm. and, went on, and this, it's impossible. So but what we do is we set, try to set a standard that this is what we hope to see, but then there's, um, a, there's this continuum within it of characters that, that don't accept that um, or play against those um, mm -hmm. norms. So I don't... Um, I would argue that there, that no matter what society you're trying to create, um, mm -hmm. even um, that either because players are going to bring it in and it's going to get played out, or it will be naive to assume that everybody just believes the same thing. Um, are you speaking of historical? Uh, like historical? Well, I'm thinking. Well, I'm I'm going to be running a Mad Max uh, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. game soon, which is yeah. far from um, and yet has you know has women who are among the the war boys, but mm -hmm. doesn't. Isn't like sensitive to them or anything, um, so uh, it's and yeah, yeah, so it's messed up. I would like, argue that um, clear. <laughs> one of the things that we don't do as well in the United States that I hope we will do better with in the future is um, pre-game and post-game um, activities um, prior to uh, role play, so that you see the people as people. Um, and that you can have these actual discussions about, in this game, we are role-playing sexism, mm -hmm. right? And these characters are sexist. And you also have some choice in that if, if this is going to be, um, you, there are different characters within the game. There will be a character that's really a target of a lot of the sexist um, versus some that may be less of a target of it. And people can have some calibration of to which kind um, of character they wish um, to play. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. 
the game in general. Uh, yeah, 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 are well, yeah. yeah, but that, that begs you the question. You were going to get it. Yeah, begs the question about what are the pre-game and post-game. What, what do you, yeah. what do you think should be done? Yeah. Um, so just also say that there, there's the al alternate approaches that I think that um, I don't know the Mad Max literature very well. It's specific, but okay. there is almost no reason why you need to play sexism unless it is the, the subject of concern of the game. And I'd say you're saying that some of these people need to be men and some of these people need to be women. Why? Um, I, you know, what is inherent in the characters that you can't think about them as any gender? Uh, I, I, you know, I, I mean, like, and maybe this is a, you know, I don't tend to necessarily want to refer to that binary view, but I think that most of the time you can just take by take gender markers out and things are just fine. Uh, uh, um. In terms of, so so I think that like usually I would not have somebody need to go through, sexism is not actually very interesting to play, especially kind of like if you're in a, if you if you are of a gender that experiences it every day, you don't really need it in your game it's space. It's not so, so much escape. You know, uh, and so, so I think the question is, and like, so that I would say that I would not put it in a game unless it was specifically workshopped, modeled, debriefed. Um, if you want to find, um, uh, I can give you the names of, uh, for example, like some Nordic LARPs where they, they I, at least, I, I don't think that they're published necessarily, but I know that the creators are very open to talking about this and might have some ideas for uh, at least some workshopping that would um, that would help gear people up towards playing something like that in a, in a sensitive space. And I think also making sure that you get the consent of the players that are involved in those plot lines to okay. play those issues. Haley, yeah, and, uh, and I guess I, I, um, I have kind of a different perspective um, on it. Insofar as I, I'm working with campaign LARPs and LARPs that have highly codified rule systems, mm -hmm. and, you know, I see um, there being exciting potential, um, and, and I guess this is um, this is just a very different approach, but an exciting potential to put sexism in your game mm -hmm. as a way to make players more aware of sexism that might it might be bleeding in from out of game. Mm -hmm. So I, I do think that if you write sexism. Um, into the game mechanics, and you say, hey, everybody of this gender, whether it's an imaginary gender or a real gender, the moment they try to touch a tool, you're supposed to tool block them because it's part of the game sexism. You're mm -hmm. suddenly going to notice that, that you're tool blocking people of a certain gender. You're not letting them interact with technology in a certain way, and that's, that's an out-of-game gender mechanic in which many women have trauma around touching tools because they've been tool blocked since they were little kids. Um, you know, and, and so I, I'd say, I. Depending on on what you want to accomplish, um, having sexism as a game mechanic and also having those debriefs, having community discussion, um, would might be an extremely helpful way to uh, have your player base um, transition to where where you might want to be in terms of acknowledging that it exists. Because you just never know who's going to show up if you're running a game with 75 people, and uh, it helps get everyone on the same page. Um, but also drawing, drawing from personal experience, there is a way, um, and, and Maori's workshop yesterday kind of touched on this, but there's a way of, of making plans out of game when you're like, okay, here's, here's a stereotype that's happening. Here's a gendered role that's, that's been happening in the game. How, how can we as a community of players look at the game outside of the game and make plans? To, uh, to overcome that. And I, I had the, the wonderful experience in Nero slash Alliance in 2005 of uh, becoming like the second female fighter in our entire region. Uh, in, in which it was this, this, this goofy thing though where I, I was planning to play a pacifist who only stayed in the tavern. I wanted to be a tavern keeper and just serve food. I, it was like, you know, the dream of being in a medieval village. Who cares about the game? You know, and I, I, I was trying to go for that. And uh, some folks on, on staff were just like, no, no, no. And they, they plotted. They had a sword spirit bound to my character. Um, <laughs> you know, and, and, uh, and the, this funny, Conform. funny dynamic. Yeah. <laughs> well, it, 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 was, it was interesting because they, they noticed that I, 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 I do have a bit of proficiency. Like, I was pretty good at, as an NPC when I I'd take a lot of breaks from my role as tavern keeper. And I'd, I'd go over to Monster Camp for five hours and gap a bunch of people. And they were just like, okay, why, you know, why isn't that part of your character? And I was like, well, she's a pacifist. That's how she's written. And uh, kind of without my knowledge, there was some plotting that went on. And I was really happy with the outcome. Um, and the, the other female fight, fighter really mentored me. And there was this, this experience of having her 
like confront me in the tavern and just be like, like you're gonna learn how to fight. We are going up against the Strega and she'll destroy the world. And, ah, you know, and it, was, it, was, it, was, it was really marvelous to get to, to transition towards being a frontline fighter and towards being someone where when the, the big bad monsters are coming into town at midnight on a Saturday night, they're coming to my cabin like, get Ellie, she's got a, she's the lefty who's got to be on this side of my shield, blah, 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 you know, and, and, and that, that, was, that was fun to see how the, you know, people who were involved in the game um, consciously worked to, to, um, to have that transition happen, and now there are quite a few more female fighters mm -hmm. in that chapter, and, uh, yeah. I'm sorry, and I didn't mean to imply that like that that but I think that the, the playing on that is it can be awesome, it can be amazing, and it can be fire. I think it's it's just the unconscious play of like sort of putting it in and not dealing with it in any way that can be Yeah. It's like, oh it's just right. a sexist world setting, you yeah. know, versus like what is the story yeah. that we're trying to tell and what's I, the point we're trying to make. Mm -hmm. I, I think there's actually like Mari talked about it a little bit earlier and you know, that conversation about being the second female fighter in your, your group in two thousand eight. Oh, 2005. 2005? I mean, the game's been going on since, what, 1992? 89 or something. <laughs> I mean, so after 20 years, I'm not saying that her chapter was going on, but like, um, and I don't know if you were going to ask about this or not, but, um, you know, we take a lot of, like, our, our, the roles that women do in real life, like, you know, emotional labor, um, caretaking, you know, feeding, tavern keeper, and women come into LARPs and those are the things they know, and so those are the things they do, and men come into LARPs and those are the things women do, so those are the things they kind of pigeonhole women into. And when we do see women who are like, I'm gonna be a fighter, um, you know, some people are really supportive of it in the weirdest, sexist way. Oh my God, you're such a great fighter for a girl. Um, yeah, like, oh man, I'm super impressed by the fact that you can fight. Um, <laughs> Let me kick your ass. Yeah, right. <laughs> right. Like it, it, you get this really weird, like, gender, let me like. Teach you how to yeah. <laughs> let me teach. Let me teach you how to be a better badass because I'm so I excited. All about it. Yeah, <laughs> I know all about it. Yeah, and, and oh, and I'm gonna take you under my wing, and you're gonna be, you know, my, my cute little female guard, and you know, it's so weird to me because, like, you know, we, you know, women come into spaces and. They don't necessarily pigeonhole themselves, but they do what they feel comfortable with, and you know, society kind of pigeonholes us already. And I'll say, men do this too. Men and do it too. They like are sometimes prisoners of the toxic true. masculinity. Right. Well, and that's I'm not a person interested in fighting, and I'm going to be looked down upon. Right. No. Yeah. So men will come, and I was going to get to that. Sorry. Well, no. No. It's okay because it's <laughs> correct. And men will come in, and people will hand them a sword and a shield in their game, or they'll hand them a you know a, a masculine like you're now you're going to be the prince of the city. I'm going to be the prince of the city. I want to be the secretary. <laughs> Can't I be the harpy, please? Like, and and they're like, no, you need to be in charge. I don't want to be in charge. Even just because I'm the man doesn't make me in charge. Mm. So men wind up in positions they don't necessarily want to be in because that's a traditionally masculine role. Women wind up in positions they don't want to be in because it's a traditionally female role. And when they do cross those gender barriers, they get these weird side eyes of like, you know, go you woman for taking the leadership role and man. What are you doing, guy? For, for, for being, playing the support role. For and playing the support hands. role. Yeah. Yeah. I will challenge you or anyone to write the characters gender neutral from the start. Yeah. yeah. And it's so hard. It is. Because and I don't and I, and I, and I don't mean this to be okay. personal to you at all. But um, I will just give a quick anecdote and then um, we were trying to write historical characters, and they're saying, well, this person was in the South in the 1800s. It matters whether they were male or female if I'm writing their light side and their dark side and their backstory and their stuff because their experiences were completely different. How can I possibly write a historical character that's agendered? Well, you come up to where the level of the conflict is, right? If you're a woman, you, the, the conflict might have been you needed, you wanted to fight, but they wanted to make you teach, learn how to sew, right? And they're stuck on that level, whereas the conflict really is meeting expectations of society or meeting expectations of a family, whether, and that is an agendered conflict. Mm -hmm. So, then, what did you want to say? Um, okay, so the Mad Max game, so it is, it's very much about masculinity. Mm -hmm. All the characters are, are war boys, and it is, mm -hmm. I don't know if you, you know Fury Road, so yeah. there's, this, there's this culture around there, but war boys are not necessarily um, boys, right? So they're, they're, mm -hmm. um, uh, so the characters are all written as, so the characters are all socially male, uh, so socially men uh, boys, yeah, boys, right? Yeah, so they're sure. they're uh, they're masculine, and they will they will you know there's no pronouning, right? They're they're all he, um, but 
uh, uh, they, but their 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 actual uh, you know their actual identity and uh, uh, and and biology is is up to the player. Mm -hmm. um, uh, well, with with one exception. But, um, who is the, they have um, exceptions. That yeah, well, there was one. I, I wrote in one character who was who was known for he's he's a particularly badass because he miscarried and and delivered during a battle and continued to fight. Oh, um, yeah. So uh, you know, he's he's know. recognized for that. I think though that 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 is one of those cases where you have made the conceit of the conceit of the game has a gender representation placed into it, right? Yeah. Your biology doesn't matter, everyone's a boy, right? That is the, con that is the gender well. conceit of the game. And so that is kind of the agender for your game, right? right. Actual gender doesn't matter, everyone's a war boy. Mm -hmm. And that will help everyone who is a war boy be accepted as a war boy. Yeah. Right, yeah, but, it is, but it's also, I mean, it's sexist, right? It it's, is. A, it's, a, it's, a, it's not a, it's not a, it's not a, open, you know, but structure